Thank you very much. OK, so uh, we're going to see a few examples today. I don't know how many of you have tried to solve the one that I gave you very quickly at the end. Uh, but what we're going to do today is apply the transport theorem as much as we can. So this is what we demonstrated last time as the relationship between the rates of change of vector, generic vector B as seen by two different reference frames, A and B, cross B. We stared at this formula for a while, and uh, we also noted the following properties, uh, that omega BA is equal to minus omega AB. And uh, I'm really pleased with how the class is going. I always get some comments at the end. Uh, one of you came after the lecture and asked me, well, um, remember this came from this expression, 0 equals uh, 0 plus omega BA plus omega these are vectors, vectors, vectors. A, B, cross with B. So we got to this point and we said, OK, well, if this has to be 0, this term, of course, has to be 0. And I derived that this expression by setting up that uh, summation of vectors uh, to be 0. Of course, there are other options uh, for having this cross product to be 0. I mean, they can be, B can be 0, but that will be pretty uh, simple case, as you can imagine. Uh, well, this goes to 0. It's fine. It's one case, a uh, very special case. The other one, in general, when you see an omega uh, cross b, om uh, omega b a cross b being 0, one case where this is not 0 is when uh, the two vectors are parallel to each other. That's, that's another special case, if you like. And if you think about it, in the, uh, when we also demonstrated that for a single axis rotation, the angular velocity is something that will look like the <coughs> derivative of an angle times the unit vector of the axis of rotation. Well, imagine this, this was your E1, E2, E3 coming out of the page. And this was fixed reference frame A, and then I said uh, this is little e1, little e2. The e3s correspond to each other, and this was fixed uh, in B. And I call this angle theta to demonstrate that for this special case, if you like, this single axis rotation, that this is true. Well, imagine a vector parallel to B. Of course, it's change is going to be the same in both reference frames. So this, this term will not be there. That's a special case. Because the only thing that you really see is, at the most, the vector changing magnitude. It's going to be parallel to omega. And so the two observers will see the same change, only the magnitude. <coughs> do, do we all see that? If I have a vector, so omega is sticking out of this board in this, in this example. Um, if that's true, b also is sticking out of the board, or maybe going in. Uh, so as the same projection on both coordinate systems on E3, so they basically write the vectors the same way. So that makes sense to be 0. That, those are you know, uh, very special cases. That can happen. Uh, nothing strange with that. So uh, demonstrated this. We derived this. I told you that for single axis rotations, this is true. We actually demonstrated this fact. And that we're going to see how to expand this and, and make it general through three degrees of freedom rotations, three axis rotations. We're not going to do it for a while, but we'll get there when we define other angles. So we're going to break down generic rotations in 3D Euclidean space as single axis rotations with the appropriate axis, with intermediate axis. That's how other angles are defined, so that we can, in the end, reduce everything to this uh, simple fact that we have. And we're going to start seeing problems with this. The, um, I believe there was one more property that we uh, derived. So let's say that this is. One property of the angular velocities between two frames. This is true for a uh, simple rotation about one axis. And then we also said that if you have more frames involved, uh, say C, A, B, and C, the angular velocity can be added. So the angular velocity of reference frame C, as seen by an observer in A, can be broken into omega B, A, plus 
omega CB, right, for example. So if you like to s memorize this the, the following way, you can go you know, from the right to the left reading these superscripts. So you go from C to A in the end, and so you can add angular velocities. And we demonstrated this too. OK. So if there's no questions about the transport theorem, at least the, uh, let's call it the theoretical part, let's, um, let's just do that first example which is a very simple one. And then I hope there is time to start a second one, which is a little more complicated. And I'll try to give some for you to do uh, and take home. And again, I don't collect homeworks. I, whatever I give you here, I don't intend to solve it the next time you come to office hours. And we'll do it then if you want. Uh, if you have questions, that's really what I want to do. Uh, OK, so this was the problem we, we uh, briefly described last time. Disk rigid body D, I'm looking at one uh, point P on the disk. The center of the disk is O. The radius is little r. This is not a vector. This is just the distance between O and P. Um, let's see. Uh, and uh, we say that O is fixed to what I call the ground. Try to make the effort to think about these problems as physical objects. They are physical objects. This is a disk. So the ground is this floor. And maybe if, if, you, if it makes you feel better, this is the floor down here. And maybe this disk is attached to some kind of pole that is attached to the ground so, so that you can imagine how the point O is fixed with respect to the ground. That's a, that can be a physical system, right? Just the wheel that is spinning about point O. OK, so what else am I missing here? Um, well, in an exam, I wouldn't probably give you much more than this. Um, but here, I'm going to draw this angle here, uh, call it theta, with respect to the horizontal direction, if you want. And so what I want are two different things. I want the velocity of p in the reference frame of the disk, as seen by an observer fixed to the disk. And then I want the velocity of the same point as seen by an observer fixed to the ground. So let's call these the ground. OK? I know it looks very easy, very simple. But we're not going to skip any steps. We're going to be extremely pedantic in defining everything we need. So I'm asking you rates of change, of course. Of what? Position. Positions. What do I need to define? Reference, reference frames first. What are two reference frames that make sense? The disk is one. So you, I expect you to do this for every single problem, especially in the tests. OK, let's say D is the disk. I will just call it D from now on. Actually, already called it D there. And then the other one that makes sense is the ground. We usually do that. We, we, we pick a reference frame, which is the preferred one, call it the ground, from which we think we are observing things, right? So I'm, uh, I'm the guy down here looking at the disk. It doesn't have to be. I mean, you could be sitting on the disk. That's actually what I'm asking you in question one. But it makes it easier for us. It's more intuitive if you like to always, you know, Call the ground like the main one, the one where you imagine yourself sitting. OK, reference frames, D and ground. <coughs> you could, if you want to be extremely thorough here, just actually tell me what are the three points on those reference frames. Well, um, remember the reference frame is a collection of at least three points whose mutual distances don't change. So I think for the disk, the center is definitely OK and then pick two other. One could be P, if you like, and another one could be just another point on the disk, as long as their distances don't change. You could do that. Uh, the ground, always fixed to the ground as well. The point can be fixed into reference frames. There's no problem with that. And then another point can be down here, and another point somewhere here, a meter from uh, the projection of O on the, on the floor, if you like. But they are, they are there. They exist. I can define them. Um, next step is what? coordinate systems.
Here you can really do whatever you want, even with the reference frames. But I think those make sense. Usually, when you have objects moving, it makes sense to define the objects as reference frames. That usually works fine. Coordinate systems, you can do whatever you want. But even even here, you may want to be a little smart and make uh, make your life easy, right? So let's start with well, we started with the disk. Uh, Let's start with the ground now. Uh, what do you want to pick? What is the sequence? I'm going to do it step by step every time. We're not going to skip any steps. What is the first thing you do when you want to define a coordinate system? OK, I think O is a good one. So let's, let's do the ground first, G. O as origin. And that's fine. Now I need the basis. How about this one here? It doesn't matter what I draw these, these vectors. Remember, they are free vectors. How about EX <coughs> in that direction? Which, how do I define that? Well, I can call it the horizontal, but I can also call it along, say that that's along OP at theta equals 0. That's a very well-defined direction. And then, I don't know if I want to call it x. 1, 2, 3, x, y, z are going to be the same thing. Let me call it e1. OK, so I can pick then e3, for example, as out of the page. Again, I can do it here. Doesn't matter. E3, and then E2 is going to be the cross product between the two. And if you don't believe this is true, you can do your trick, right hand rule, whatever you works for you, as long as you get them right. So E2 is E3 cross with E1. That's my first coordinate system. And it's perfectly fine to make a mistake with this. As long as you can fix it. If you're not sure 100%, many times I'm not sure 100% with these vectors, and I just do my diagram. There's no reason to make a mistake there. OK, that's the first one. Then we do the disk. Let's see if I can fit it in here. Well, I would say that O as origin works as well, right? And Picking these things is really a matter of, of practicing. I mean, it's, it's practice with problems. Again, you could, you could pick this point down here as the origin. Uh, I'm fine with you doing that, but you're making a, your life a little more difficult. You could. So let's see. Um, what I'm going to do now is pick this other coordinate system, which is now fixed with D. So origin is, is chosen. I'm going to choose E1 along OP and I don't need to say anything else OP at any time it goes with the disk it needs to be fixed with the disk as the disk rotates those vectors have to go with the disk E3 well this is definitely a planar problem it's the same as big E3 little E3 and big E3 are the same thing so E2 is going to be a similar cross product E3 cross with E1 and so I keep moving this poor point P around, but uh, basically this is going to be E3 as well coming out of the page. Can you all see okay? Is this too small? E2, I guess that means no. Means you see, you see it fine. Okay, so that's my uh, other coordinate system. I expect you to do these things. They're obvious. You've done it all the time, but. I still expect you to do it, because they're important steps. They make you visualize the problem. So OK, um, well, I go back to the questions now. I do have all the, the tools that I need. I have my reference frames, my, my coordinate systems. I can start implementing the problem. I can start converting things into expressions, uh, vectors into, into projections uh, with coordinate systems. So what I'm really asking you, and I think I will continue to erase this side so that the picture remains there, 
Question one. I'm going to mess up this picture a little too much. So now I'm looking at this vector OP. Or the vector R, ROP. Let's call it ROP. The vector that goes from O to the, from the position of P with respect to O. Let's call it that way. And if you want, we can drop this and just call it R. It's up to you, or R of P. That's probably better. So that's my position vector. I haven't expressed it in any coordinate system. That exists in space. It's there. And uh, now you're asking me to do question one, which is velocity of P with respect to the disk, with respect to another observer, which is sitting here on the disk. And it's attached to the disk as well. Well, what is that? D, dt in D of RP. What is RP? RU1. So what is this? P is a point that it belongs to the disk. It's part of the disk. So it's, uh, it's is this changing? R is not changing. E1 is not changing in D. So that's, that's pretty easy, right? Zero. It's a point on the disk. The point is attached to the disk. I'm attached to the disk. I don't see any motion with respect to myself. OK. Well, then the second question is now D, let me rewrite it, VP with respect to the ground is D dt of rp now with respect to the ground. Now you can do it in two ways. I'll do it with the transport theorem, which tells me that this is equal to d dt of rp with respect to the disk plus omega of the disk with respect to the ground. So this is the angular velocity of the disk as seen by an observer fixed to the ground, this gentleman down here, cross with RP. What we called B for a few lectures now, it's the vector we're dealing with. <coughs> well, that's, that's, that's a good way to do it. This is already a 0. I computed it up here. And so I just need to compute the uh, cross product. Um, Omega of the disk with respect to the ground is, this is exactly the example we, uh, we did last time. It's theta dot E3, right? Theta dot E3 cross with RE1. That is theta dot R. E2. Done. So what this is telling me is that the velocity of a, the point P as seen by this observer down here, it's a vector that has the direction of E2. That kind of makes sense, right? Tangential direction, it's going that way. And that's the magnitude r theta dot, which from other classes you've taken, that also kind of makes sense, right? Uh, the angular rate times the distance from the uh, point of rotation axis of rotation, which in this case collapses to a point. It's a 2D problem. That is the one way that you should really should uh, use for a problem like this. But this is a relatively simple one. So I could do it in another way. I could write RP as um, it's a vector. So it's up to me to decide which coordinate system I use. I use the other one. I write it in, in big E1, E, and big E2, uh, and big E3, the coordinate system. So that, that gives me R cosine of theta E1 plus R sine of theta E2. I already don't like these. I see sines and cosines. But let's use this. Well, then I don't go through the transport theorem. I already have the position of the point P in a coordinate system, which is fixed to the ground. So I can just take this derivative directly. These, these two vectors are not going to change with respect to the ground. So if I do it from there, I get r 
well, r is constant. Remember, r is constant. So it's minus theta dot r sine of theta e1. Do we agree on this one? Plus theta dot r cosine of theta e2. And this was a very simple problem. And this formula is ugly. I don't like it. This has a geometrical meaning. I can see it. This is exploiting ge the geometry of the problem. I can, it makes sense. It's the, the, the velocity is tangential to the disk because that point is right there uh, at the edge of the disk. This, I don't see a, a geometrical meaning. I mean, it's two components that have magnitude theta dot r sine of theta and theta dot r cosine of theta. It's, it's, it really loses the meaning um, of being able to see um, what is going on with vectors. So the transport theorem is really useful when you cannot be in the other frame. For, but for the problems we'll solve, we can be in the other frame. The other frame is, in this case, g, right? I can be there. I can write the vector in g. So in this case, I can. Uh, the question is, do you want to do it? Because with a problem which is as simple as that one, it already comes down to definitely more algebra than doing it with a transport theorem, which makes, means that you can make more mistakes, more steps involved. Algebraic steps means more chances of mistakes, of course, more derivatives, more complicated derivatives, and final expressions that are not as nice as what you could get with transport theorem. Simple problem. Well, actually, let's add one more, a couple more questions here. Let's say that you now want the acceleration of p. In D, well, that should be a no-brainer at this point. And the acceleration of P in G. OK, so let's try to use this side. The first one is, let's talk about what is the definition of acceleration. Is D in DT in D of? This vector. <coughs> That's another zero. Right? It's attached to the disk. I'm sitting on the disk. Velocity, position doesn't change. Velocity doesn't change. Nothing changes. If I want to instead compute the acceleration of p with respect to the ground, there are, again, two ways. I have computed the velocity. And this is already expressed in the uh, grounds reference frame, E1, big E1, and big E2. So you can take another derivative of that thing. I'm not, not going to do it. That's ugly enough already. Well, if you want, I can do the first one. I can do this derivative of the first component. Uh, so that gives me minus theta double dot, remember r is constant, r sine of theta. Let's see, minus, I think I see a theta dot squared, r cosine of theta. So this will be the first component, the time derivative of the first component. So more terms are coming up. It becomes bigger and bigger. Or you can do it with the transport theorem, which means that this is equal to the derivative of d dt in d of v p in d in g, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is right. This is wrong. Thank you. Plus, same thing, omega cross. So this is omega dg cross with the same vector, right, v p in g. I have it there. This vector that I'm looking at, that I'm going to use, is this vector I just computed. So uh, let's see what I have space. I don't need all this. And let me rewrite it here. So V, P, in G, we already did that. And that is 
theta dot r e2. OK, so what is the first term? D, D, what is the first term? Mm, you sure? So I'm looking at D. Yeah, let's think about this. I mean, there's no rush here. V, P, in G, with respect to the disk. The, with respect to, it's, it's really key. You can't forget that. So, so I'm doing the, the rate of change with respect to the disk of that expression, which is theta dot r e2. So I need to think about what is changing in that reference frame, in the disk reference frame. Well, the theta is changing, the r is not, the e2 is not. So this makes sense to be theta double dot r e2, right? Pretty simple. And then the uh, second term, which is omega d g cross with v p g. Well, this is going to be, again, theta dot e3. That's my angular velocity, omega dg, cross with same vector, theta dot r e2, which is going to be theta dot squared r, what is e3 cross with e2? So in the end, your acceleration of p with respect to the ground is composed by these two terms. We have, let's just order them, theta dot squared r e1 plus theta double dot r e2. Sines and cosines are gone. And I don't like them. They don't give me physical intuition. This does. I see the acceleration of that point as seen by the observer on the ground being composed by a uh, radial component, if you like, this theta dot squared r, and uh, the tangential component theta double dot r. I can visualize, I mean, two vectors in two different directions that way, but if you start having sines and cosines, I don't know. So what is important to understand is that I, I'm asking you what the observer sees the observer on, on the ground sees, but there is, it is perfectly fine to express that in terms of a coordinate system which is not fixed to the ground. That's fine. So this is what the observer fixed to the ground sees sitting down here, but it's using this, this, this coordinate system to express that fact, what he, what he sees. That's perfectly fine. Unless someone is asking you specifically, then transform this into the, the other coordinate system fixed to the ground, that's, that's another story that, that you can do it. But I'm not asking you to do that. You can leave it like this. Does it make sense? OK. And this was a simple problem. One more comment. When I write things such as d, dt, I wrote it before, the position of p with respect to uh, the disk, for example, note that the fact of taking the rate of change depends on the reference frame. Uh, the vector position doesn't. It doesn't, right? It's the, it's the fact that you're taking the rate of change with respect. The, the, the fact that it, the observer is involved makes this d in dt change depending on the reference frame. But the vector on which I operate, it's, it's the vector. It doesn't change. The result that you obtain is different. This will be the velocity of p in d. If you do this rate of change in G, then this will be a different vector. Any questions on this one before we make it a little more complicated? No questions? OK. So let's say that we can, five minutes, yeah, it should be time. We uh, release that R from being constant. Let me redraw the whole thing. It's a completely new, different problem. And then at home, I will add one more rotation for you if, you if you want to play with it. It's 
say that I have something like a tube or a straw, whatever that is. Um, and there's a particle here that can go up and down. This is point O again. So it's definitely the same problem. But now R is not constant anymore. Call this O. I'm going to call, again, this distance R. OK. And call this uh, the arm, if you like, this, this straw, this tube containing the particle P. And this is, again, the ground. And I, I want the same things. I want velocity of p with respect to the disk, acceleration of p with respect to the disk, and then with respect to the ground. R is not constant anymore. So we go through the same drill every single time. Reference frames. Same. A is the arm. So one observer will be sitting on this arm, and attached to the arm will be hugging the arm, if you like, and rotating with it. And the other one is the ground. Coordinate systems. Do it this way. Let's embed a coordinate system to the arm. This time we'll start from A. Why not? O is the origin. And the coordinate systems are going to be the same here. And let's change names just for fun now. This is ER, little ER. Little ER is along. OP, um, E, Z, out of page, and then I'll call the cross product between the two E, theta. So this is easy with the ER. So this starts sounding like polar coordinates already, right? Radial, tangential. That's what I've used before. Those, that's, those are polar coordinates. The ones attached to the rotating object in this case. OK, uh, ground is, well, no brainer again. I'm going to do O as origin. You wouldn't believe how many mistakes are made because People do not define these things properly at the beginning. And then they, I've seen problems solved where uh, students, people would switch the origin at some point without knowing that because they haven't defined it at the beginning. Going through these steps makes things clear for you. At least it does for me. So um, always the origin, E1. Uh, let's call it E1 again. E1 is. Uh, along OP at theta equals 0, or time equals 0, if you like. And then we have the same. E3 is basically EZ, and E2 is going to be E3 cross with E1. Yes. OK, so it's as before. E1, E3, E2. OK. Let's do the velocities first. With respect to the disk, it's obviously going to be the easier one. Uh, v, P, in D is the rate of change of the position of P with respect to O. I dropped that. Uh, 
notation. It's obviously with respect to, or to the origin. With respect to the disk, I suggest that you write these every time. Don't skip steps. I know this is obvious. It should be obvious, but I, I would rather write it every time. What is the velocity of p with respect to the disk that I'm asking you? Is the rate of change of a specific vector as seen by an observer in D. So what is rp? As before, it's r little er. Now, this is not 0 anymore. Er is not changing in, uh, I'm sorry, I keep calling it D, and I actually called it A, right? Sorry about that. That's not the disk anymore, it's the arm. D doesn't even exist as a reference frame. I haven't defined it. OK, um, what is this going to be? R dot ER. R is changing. OK. And that's it. The velocity of P with respect to the ground is now transport theorem, if you like. DDT of RP with respect to the ground, which is DDT of RP with respect to the arm plus the omega of the arm as seen by an observer fixed to the ground cross with RP. I've just computed this. So this is R dot little er. This is the first term. And then the second is going to be theta dot, what do we call this now? Um, EZ, little EZ, right? Cross with RP, that's RER. Which will give you R dot ER plus R theta dot E theta. So this was what you had before. There is this additional term, and it makes sense. Now the velocity of the point P, which is constrained to move in that straw, in that tube, inside that arm, is made up of two components. This was the tangential one I had before. So if you lock R in place, say that R doesn't change, cannot change. This goes away. This is what you get. Uh, if you lock theta, so this goes away, that is not changing, this is what you get. It makes sense. It's just a radial component. So this is geometrically making sense. I can see it. I can justify. I can look at this final result and, and think about it and, and, and comment about it. it. It is making sense. Let's do it the other way before we go to accelerations. I can do it the other way just to show how ugly it is. Um, so RP. To do it the other way, to just take directly the derivatives in the coordinate system which is attached to the ground, I can also write it as, as before, r cosine of theta big E1 plus r sine of theta big E2. The r doesn't change. Its derivative is going to change if I just start from that expression. Now r is changing. r dot cosine of theta minus theta dot r sine of theta times e1. And then the same for the other one. I have to compute r dot sine of theta plus r theta dot cosine of theta e2. Compare these two. Of course, they are the same thing. And this is not a good exercise you can go through. Uh, demonstrate that these are the same vector. They need to. They better be the same vector. This is just different ways of representing the same vector, which is the velocity of p with respect to an observer fixed to the ground. But when I compare these against these, well, there's a huge benefit in going this route. So much more compact, making geometrical sense. These. Can you really explain to me what this is? Because I can't. I really can't. So, and this is just velocity. Then the acceleration, you will have to do another derivative of this nice expression down here. So that's why the transport theorem is so powerful. It's not just because you 
sometimes cannot be in the reference frame where you want your rates of change, it's because it makes things easier. And that's how we built the transport theorem, is we're we using the geometry be behind the problems that we solve. We are exploiting the geometry. That's what I'm doing there, attaching that reference frame, that coordinate system to that reference frame. The little e r, little e z, and little e theta, I am geometrically exploiting the fact that this particle is, yeah, it's moving along this line, and it's also rotating with the arm. Yes? Uh, but wouldn't this complex uh, formation, which E1 and E2, will make easier the maneuverability of a satellite if we are looking through from that? Because from that, we know if from our axis, from the ground, we need something which is rotating, but we need it on, from our basis. From that sense, this complex term will be much more helpful than that. If you need it, you can, but um, you can, first of all, you can first do everything with transport theorem, get your final results, and then transform these vectors into your, into your big, uh, big E1, big E2. So the process of finding the, the rates of change, it's, it's shorter and easier. There are less steps involved. You're not doing all these, these complicated derivatives here. And this is, again, this is still a simple problem. We're going to start seeing next time different types of coordinate systems where there are more angles involved. And so things become even bigger. So you can make more mistakes. So you may need to project to express this rate of change into the big E1, big E2, big E3. Yeah, you may need in some cases to do it. Then you, you go from here and transform ER and, and E theta into big E1, big E2. That's, that's easier than doing these derivatives. It's, you can make less mistakes because that's a simple operation as the following. Uh, big E1, that's a good question. E2. This is little e3. Uh, I'm sorry, this is little er. This is little e theta. So by a simple 2D diagram, I can, I can tell that er is cosine of theta e1 plus sine of theta e2, and, and substitute in there. And the same for the other ones. And I actually suggest, and we'll do this, that no matter how complicated is your problem, Always break down things into planes. Look at things into planes, how, how the different coordinate systems are oriented with respect to each other. Because I don't know about you, but I can't really visualize two reference frames that are rotated with respect to each other and looking at them saying, OK, these are the three angles, the three other angles between the two frames. That's, that's impossible. Who can do that? Break it down into um, planes, and you can see the rotations. So yeah, you, if you need to, you can do this. But again, this is transforming a vector into another basis. It, it's still avoiding me from taking ugly derivatives. And in many cases, you don't. I mean, if this is, again, re remove the fact that this is a straw and everything. This is, this is the Earth. I'm down here, and I'm looking at this satellite flying. I may be fine with actually using radial and tangential. They make sense. From down here, that's my radial direction. That's tangential. Even if they're changing, they kind of make sense. They're actually used. I mean, on the planet Earth, we actually don't use um, x, y, z. We use longitude, latitude. We use two angles and, and, and a height. So there are coordinate systems that are more convenient anyways. Uh, and this is one of them, polar, polar coordinates. OK, so let's try to uh, do at least one acceleration here. Uh, let's see, acceleration of, well, what is it that I don't want to erase? I don't want to erase these, probably. Uh, let's see. Acceleration of the point P, as seen by an observer fixed to the arm, is going to be d dt in A of which quantity? That, right? Vp in A. And that is r double dot er. Do we agree? While the acceleration of p with respect to the ground is going to be transport theorem d dt in a of which vector? Now, this vector, 
velocity of p with respect to the ground d p in g plus omega uh, a g cross with the vector itself okay which is this vector here So let's let's do the first term. D D T in A of the velocity of P as seen by an observer fixed to the ground. So I am taking that final result I got here and I compute its rate of change as if I was attached to A. So little er and little e theta don't change. So this is going to be R double dot. ER plus, well, that gives me R dot theta dot plus R theta double dot E theta. Okay. And then omega AG cross with DPG. The omega is of theta dot little e z, and I cross it with that vector. R dot e r. Plus r theta dot e theta. Let's finish this, this cross product here. What do I get? What is EZ cross with ER? E theta. So that gives me theta dot R dot E theta. That's the first cross product. And then EZ cross with E theta gives me minus ER minus R theta dot squared ER. So when I put it all together, I have A of P as seen by an observer fixed to the ground as the addition of those, these two terms. Let's try to put it in order. The order is ER, E theta, EZ, right? So I have R double dot minus R theta dot squared little er, this takes care of this term and this term. And then I have plus e theta has 2 r dot theta dot plus r theta double dot e theta. Again, something that I can look and, and comment on. Um, ER is the real direction. Again, this is the tangential direction. Direction. If you lock R in, in place, you don't have this rate of change. You don't have this rate of change. And you, you can comment on what you see. And the same if you don't change theta. So it's again, it's a little easier to handle than doing the derivatives in the other reference frame. Now, one exercise, again, that I, I would suggest is prove that all these rates of change are the same. If I just write the vector, the position vector in the coordinate system attached to the uh, ground, and you take the derivative from directly from there, you should get the same result in the end. So when you get to your final huge formula, you have to transform little e r and little e theta in that basis, or vice versa, and get the same expression. The final acceleration has to be the same. It's just the procedure that you follow to compute that, that is different. With the transport theorem, much simpler. So we'll continue next time.
that position shouldn't be zero, easy, because we are taking the top of the ground.